Okay, ladies and gentlemen, episode 130, I believe, and uh, it's a beautiful day out here. So let's get our posture cranked up a bit, grab yourself a refreshment of your choice. Let's get cooking, huh? Ah. All right. This episode, let's keep those tunes pumping while I run through these ads here. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is simple. You pick more or less on your favorite players in the NBA, NHL, UFC for the chance to win 100 times your money. Available in states like Texas, California, and 30 more. And it's March Madness right now. So if you think you know basketball, it's a good way to make yourself some cheddar. And uh, use code TIMBO, all caps. Put in $100, get 100 free. And it's a really fun way to watch fights watch sporting events and i've been enjoying it that's prize picks code timbo also brought to you by riz pharma and riz pharma is a dedicated to making prescription medications affordable for everyone particularly targeting the uninsured and the underinsured populations their program aims to alleviate the financial burden of medical costs by offering over 800 plus generic medications for free at a very low cost utilizing strategic partnerships and bulk buying powder power riz pharma emphasizes the importance of customer service offering a team of experienced pharmacy professionals to assist customers with medication inquiries and education this support system is a critical component of their mission to improve lives by making medications accessible and affordable check it out riz pharma.com the owner of that john he's a great guy L looking to help people all the time but we're here with my uh, friend evan longoria Long-time baseball player. How long you been playing baseball? <laughs> uh, since I was four. I mean, um, professionally for the last 16 years, but signed in 2006 uh, out of Long Beach State and um, made it to the big leagues in 2008. So when did you really realize, like, baseball was going to be your life? I would say, like, junior college. Um, maybe, maybe my first year at Long Beach State. Um, and you were just knocking some dingers over the fence and you knew it? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it was more like this school <laughs> isn't for me, you know? So I was like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, um, you know, take this baseball thing as, as far as it could go and whatever journey that meant, you know, whatever road that, that, uh, you know, took me down, um, I was kind of kind of be committed to that for for a good while mm -hmm. and did your parents like the, were your parents how were your parents great um my parents are uh, still married um you know still have both of them thank thank god um and they were just like super supportive my my dad coached me up until eighth grade um but was very like supportive wasn't like the crazy dad that like you know, was, was hard on me after every game and was, you know, forcing me to, to do a bunch of shit that I didn't want to do. And, um, just kind of there and, um, and supportive. And like I said, he, he was always at the practices. Um, you know, he worked up until, uh, usually practice time. So he'd meet me there and then he'd, and I'd come home with them. And, um, I give, I give a lot of credit to my mom too. I mean, my mom, I remember, you know, as, as a kid, like she'd have me out in the front yard, like rolling me ground balls, um, you know, before my dad would get home, a um, lot of to and from practice with her. Uh, and so, you know, both of them just, uh, you know, really probably couldn't accomplish what I, what I've done without them. So they kind of made it, they made it fun for you. I mean, you see it all the time in grappling. You see these parents, you see these parents that are just so hard nose they want their kid to focus and work hard come on and they're four years old <laughs> yeah yeah um so they were they kept it fun for you yeah i mean there was, it wasn't like um you know it wasn't like uh oh w as i got older right like in that you know from the time i was four to like 10 um mm -hmm. it was lighthearted, you know and then as i got a little bit older you know i think you can uh, you know, you don't, you don't have kids, but, I, but I have, you know, three of my own and, um, you can kind of tell, uh, as a parent, when you get kids into something, um, you know, whether it's sports or school or whatever it is, like you can kind of tell like pretty quickly 
what they latch on to and what they really love, you know? And, um, and so I think my parents could see like from, from pretty early on that like baseball was my thing. Like I played basketball and football, um, up until eighth grade, I played a little bit of like uh, summer basketball going into, co- going into high school. I played some water. I played two years of water polo uh, while I was in high school, but the good majority of my time was spent on baseball. And you could just tell that that's what I loved uh, mm-hmm. from an early age. So um, I think that they just, you know, kind of knew that and didn't force it upon me, but like, you know, kind of guided me down that path of like getting more and more serious as I got older and, um, you know, finding the right, the right pathways for me. So you still had to go to college? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't great. Um, I was a good player in high school. Wasn't, um, you know, like I wasn't ready by any means to, to be a professional. So, um, I, I developed pretty late, like physically, I was a late, um, puberty, late, late maturing kid. So I did a lot of my growing in like my junior and senior year of high school, uh, was super skinny. I think I probably left high school at like, I don't know, 165, 170 pounds. Um, and th- in those first two years of, I went to junior college for one, Rio Hondo and Whittier. Uh, and then I went to two years at Long Beach State. And in those, you know, three years, I got much, much better as a baseball player, but also physically much bigger. I probably gained, um, you know, probably gained two or three inches and you know, 15 pounds um, on my frame. And so, um, you know, all those things like support, obviously being a bigger, stronger faster player i mean you see guys put people in like prep schools they put in prep schools from young young age and then still they don't even end up making it like as a starter at the mlb is it more like you got it or you don't or is it i don't know man i mean i guess to put it in like you know terms that maybe you or the you know most of the audience like it's like if you you know you 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 told me this the day one when we were in here talking about suge like you've known him since he was 17 years old and you just know like you just knew when the lights came on like he was gonna be that dude you know and like i think that's part of it right it's like one part of it is like the the work ethic and the desire and um you know, the, the, the shit that they're putting in here on the mats before, because like, you know, even if Suge was as great as he is, like, he's still got to put the work in, in here, you know, or else you're just going to get flat out outworked, you know? So that's one component of it. And then when the lights come on, how, how are you, you know, because like, I've seen a lot of dudes who are like way more talented than me just falter because they don't work and they don't care. You know, they just have this natural ability, but they don't put the work in. And then on the flip side, I've seen guys who are like, you know, a little less talented than most guys, but really work hard. And when the lights come on, they show up, you know, and so that's, it's hard to answer that question. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. And then a lot of it too, is a lot of guys' bodies don't hold up. Yeah. Yeah. Injuries are a big deal too, right? Like anything. It's like, I, I've played with plenty of guys who just like, dude, this guy's like way more talented than anybody I've ever seen. And it's like a knee injury and an ankle injury and an oblique and you know and there's at the highest levels of the game there's really no patience for that with I mean unless you're like a guy like Jacob deGrom who like you know I don't know if you know who that is but like he's when he's healthy he's legitimately the best pitcher in Major League Baseball but like he was healthy for about the first four years of his career he won two Cy Youngs and then he's kind of been injured like every other year and it's like he keeps getting paid like $40 million a year just because when he's healthy, he is the best. Um, But yeah, I mean, being on the field, being able to post in the octagon, like shit like that is like obviously the most important thing, right? Being able to to just show up on the day that, uh, that you're scheduled to, to perform. So yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. The injuries, I mean, that's happens most of the time in fighting. There's so many guys that are just so skilled, some of the best guys in the room, but their just body can't stay healthy enough for the long run. Uh, that's where Brandon Harris, that's actually where I met Evan is Brandon Harris because you were training with Brandon, right? I was, yeah, but I trained with him, um, for the last three years, three, four years of my career. Um, yeah, thankfully I found Brandon too, man. Cause I actually, I actually heard Brandon's name for the first time through a guy by the name of Donnie Ecker, who, I went to I went to college with at Long Beach. He was a freshman when I was a sophomore, um, and then he transferred out, and we kind of lost touch. And then he was actually the assistant hitting coach in San Francisco when I was there, um, 
to uh, God, I can't remember the years, but my last my last couple of years there, um, and he mentioned Brandon's name. He's like, "Hey, yeah, like, I know this guy. You know, um, uh, I've only met him a couple times. Worked out with him a few times, I think. But like, people are like talking about this guy. Like, he's you know great. Yeah, yeah. So I just showed up and like I you know I was with him for for the last like three or four years of my career. Yeah, people ask me, they're like, "Well, if you could have done anything different in your fight career, what would it have been? It would have been finding Brandon Harris and just making me healthy for the practices that matter instead of strength and conditioning. You go to a strength conditioning coach, and they're just trying to, to break you and push you and make you tired. And it's like, that's not your sport. Your sport is doing MMA and boxing and striking and jujitsu and stuff. You should be healthy for those practices. So that's definitely something I uh, would have done different. Is there any, like, pregame rituals that you – would do um i i tried to stay pretty consistent with like showing up at the same times like that was like you know big part of the routine for me was like getting there around the same time so that i had the same kind of time frame to to work within before the game i think i think like the misconception with um with baseball is like like other sports you know uh you like with basketball you know they, they show up like at five o'clock for like a 7 p.m game you know they might have a shoot around in the morning then they go back home and then you know same thing with hockey like they'll skate around in the morning they'll go back home they'll show up at like five for a seven o'clock game like with baseball it's every day and it's a long day like i was you know i i would normally get to the field around twelve thirty for a seven o'clock game um, here so um and you know most of that is because you spend the day like eating like I would eat lunch there and then I would um you know whether it was like train or do some extra hitting or do some early work on the field whatever it was I wanted to have that window to be able to do it but um I would say the things I did every day were um hot cold contrast um at the at the yeah so they have we had a hot cold contrast we had a um red light sauna um we had a red light bed and so you know I would find that hour and a half window between like batting practice would normally start at about 2 30 for a seven o'clock game when you're at home so from 12 30 to 2 30 i would use that window to to do like some prep and recovery stuff whether it was like work out or do the you know the recovery stuff um and then you know by the by the time 2 30 rolls around like you're into batting practice you're into taking ground balls and then after bp you have a little bit more time but i would say that was really the only thing that i stuck to um, pretty religiously was that um you know, recovery period Show, showing up on time and stuff. Yep. Huh? Um, so like, how about steroids nowadays compared to the old days? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm like, I'm so happy to be able to say I was never like tempted by it. I never, I never saw anybody take it. I never thought about taking it myself. Um, and so, you know, to be able to play as long as I did, I mean, I had some injuries, you know, like normal, normal stuff, but like, Cause how many years total did you play 16 total and the big leagues? Um, and yeah, just to be able to like come out the other end and be like, yeah, I did it clean. I did it. You know, I know that. Um, and, and that just, that just feels good. You know, wh whatever you accomplish, like when you accomplish it, like doing it on your own, like you have that, you'll always have that. Um, but yeah, like steroids, dude, it's, it's such a crazy topic because you know there's still guys getting pop like in the in you know young kids in the big leagues well, not, not just young kids but you know and and I just to me I just don't understand how it's possible you know like we, there's all these supplements out there that you can take you know and most of the guys that are playing professional sports at a very high level like you don't need that testosterone like I, I told you I just got my blood work done it was like you know 740 or something like normal level like that's like that's like very good you know mm -hmm. you don't need to like boost your unless you have like something significantly wrong right like you have like a thyroid issue or something you know like you're overweight whatever it is um you know most kids don't don't need it you know i think it's just like more of a mental crutch than anything yeah and who knows how much like influence they're having from their parents and other people back in the day where the with the boys getting juiced up because what what is this <laughs> was this is is the company that does the testing the major league baseball testing is done by a company called CDT. Um, I don't know. I don't even know what what it stands for. Um, but yeah, they have their own like. So after the you know late nineties, early two thousands, you know what we call the steroid era. Um, baseball decided to implement a testing program, and 
I don't, I don't think it was at that point that they started using this company, but eventually they started using this um, CDT company, which is like a privately held lab. Um, and it's like, I, you know, I was around for the, I think right when they first hired CDT, I don't remember exactly. It was probably 2012 or 13, you know, it was a while back. Um, and it was uh, just urine sample at that time. Um, and now they've got, it's, it's gotten, you know, very technical, technologically advanced. Um, they still do urine, um, but they've got, they, sometimes you'll have to do a urine and a blood at the same time. Is that and, like just random? Yeah, it's all random. So sometimes it's just urine. Sometimes it would just be blood. Sometimes you do both. Like on, in the off season is the only time I've done both at the same time. Um, but I guess because the urine uh, the urinalysis and the blood like they look for different things like they can pick up like little like micro traces of different things so because i asked that, i'm like why can't you just do blood the whole time because they have this um now it's this little like cartridge thing that just sticks on your arm and um it's like um it's like a uh, like a diabetic pin prick you know like when you would prick your finger to like get a little bit of blood like it's the same thing in your arm you just stick it on and then you, you push the little thing down and it pop like it pops a little needle and then it drips just a little bit of blood into this little oh that's um, nice vial thing yeah so it's not like when they first started doing blood it was an actual like intravenous blood draw that they would do so they'd have to you know hire another person to come out who was you know familiar with drawing blood and they would have to do that whole thing and that was that was a pain in the ass now it's like you know, just this little thing and so, so if a player popped for cocaine would they get suspended no, they don't test for recreational drugs unless um, unless you um, like have an issue with it. Like, you know, if you got a DUI or if you were like a drunk in public or if you had like a, a domestic abuse and they, you know, found that you had cocaine or, you know, whatever weed or something in your system or if you were drunk, excessively drunk, like you can go into... Um, I forget what it's called, but like the protocol for like, is know, that more of the team that's putting you through that? The, the, the I think the team can opt to do that, but also I think major league, Bay, you know, they can like do it jointly or the team can just do it on their own. Like if they're like, we're worried about this dude, he's like drinking excessively or, you know, going out on binges, like getting coked up. Yeah. Just fucking running the streets. Uh huh. So you guys, so you guys would travel how many days of the year usually? Well, Usually half of the season, so um, 81 days. Damn, 81 days. And, like, when you guys would go travel, would, would a lot of the team and the fellas have a good time uh, going out and having a hoot, or would they say you need to be in bed? Yeah, it's – it's well, they, they don't they don't say you need to be anywhere. You know, we don't have curfew. We don't have, like, nothing. hall monitors. No, nothing. You can no. – you can – you know, it's like um, – you know, it's like when you go to high high school to college for the first time and you're living in a dorm, you know, like there's no rules. But like if you start messing up, like, you know, you, you get the boot. Yeah, you're not going to You know, it, it's it's just performance based. Right. Like if you are able to go out and party and, and then show up the next day and perform, then, you know, nobody questions what you're doing at night. You know, but because uh, you see some guys, I mean, I, I guess not really a ton anymore. I, I guess maybe I haven't been watching a lot, but some guys that have just huge beer guts and they're yeah. still good. Yeah. I think that's more like they're probably just built that way. You know, like I don't think it's beer necessarily. Now there's some guys, you know, I've, I, there's some guys that can drink a shitload of beer. Um, but, but I think just like the more like heavier set dudes that are playing in the big leagues are probably just built that way, you know? And like it, there's no, you know, if you're able to perform at that weight, there's no real need to like, get skinny or cut weight you know mm -hmm. and like a lot of the time like I played with a few guys um who for whatever reason like they tried to lose weight and it just they were like a worse player you know because it's like I guess you get used to carrying that weight you know you're eating different things you're probably not feeling like yourself and so maybe you like take some power or some um some torque from your hips or something I, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, as you lose or gain weight, your body starts to move differently, too, you know, so maybe you don't really notice it at first. But I think there's, you know, something that happens there. So, damn. So you got any cool uh, like partying stories of the boys <laughs> going out and just having a hoot? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, the, a lot of the I mean, I, I, I can't really you know, I'm not going to like out. Yeah, I am out for you know, sure. But um, 
we we had a great time this past year obviously making making it to the world series um you know usually when the, when you make it to the playoffs like you get to um when you advance every round like you get to drink in the clubhouse like we got like champagne bottles and and you know probably 300 beers in the clubhouse so i'm sure if you see it on espn you know you're shaking the champagne and you know drinking beers in there and that usually you know uh it usually ends up somewhere else later at the club that night. Hell yeah. Um, we did we did some cool cool shit this past year. Um, probably my favorite going out story with the boys. We went. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of the box in New York. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, it's just like a variety show of like people doing weird shit, man. Like it's pretty cool though. Yeah, it's just different. You know, it's like I mean, I'm sure people will look it up. You know, it's like you could you could catch it on like a regular night where it's just like a dude, like, like whipping a lasso and like putting out candles from like across the stage. But then you could get a go on a night where there's just like a tranny using a dildo to like, you know, do weird shit. Like there was a girl, like, um, there was a girl that was like doing this swing, swinging routine thing. And she was, you know, playing with herself. It's just like, you could have a very normal night there or you could have like fucking crazy. the fucking weirdest night you've ever had, you know? And so that was one of, you know, I was with, I was actually with my wife that night, but we, it was a bunch of the, bunch of the guys were out too with, um, with their wives, some of the, some of the, uh, staff members. And, um, it was, it was just, uh, a, a pretty, pretty Hell good yeah. time. So are you officially retired now or not sure? I'm not sure. I I didn't want the reason why I haven't like announced a retirement is, um, you know, mainly to keep the 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 door a little bit open should the right opportunity arise. But um, and and you know, secondly, because I I learned this from my agent um, at kind of the middle of the off season when we were talking about it that I, apparently if you announce a retirement, you ha- if you wanted to come back, you have to wait a year. Oh damn! So. Um, yeah, there was kind of that, open. there was kind of that piece to it too. Um, and I haven't really answered that question to anybody, you know, mm-hmm. you're like the first person to like, I would, I wouldn't say like media, but like the first like actual like interview type thing yeah. that I've done about it, you know? And, um, so yeah, just, re- just mainly like keeping the door open to a potential, um, you know, right opportunity. So this has been the first time, like, because your whole life you've been just probably training. As soon as you get done with the season, you're right back to training and building. So this is the first time you've had a little bit of taste of the yeah. the retired life. And have you been keeping yourself busy? Yeah, I've been here, man. You know that. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, um, it, it, it is crazy. Um, I think, um, yeah, like you said, being this being the first off season that I've come into and been like. I don't know if I'm going to play or not, you know? So like, what are the other things I can explore doing? You know, there's a lot, a lot of things that like, you know, you just put your life on hold when you're, when you're doing, you know, when you're playing professionally, because it's like, you know, the, my biggest risk was always injury, you know, and a lot doing a lot of, um, you know, other things that are unrelated to baseball, like, well, one for, except for last year, Every other year before that, I was under a long-term contract. And if you get hurt doing something that's not baseball related, then you don't get that money, you know? So, like, I'm sure you've heard these stories of guys, like, going out playing basketball, tearing their ACL. They're under a long-term deal for baseball, and they can that, that contract gets voided, you know? So, it's like, I'm, I'm making, you know, a good amount of money. Like, I can wait on, like, going to ski, you know, or yeah. doing jujitsu or, you know, whatever it is, like... Uh, so I just I just put all those things off, and so th- this off season has kind of been the first one where I've like you know explored doing jujitsu, um, you know done. I went d- to the snow with some of my boys and just you know hung out. We actually didn't even ski. I wanted to ski. We didn't end up doing it. We just ended up drinking and hanging out. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so just those type of things that I've really like wanted to explore doing. That's kind of what I've been doing this off season. And you're waking up. Are you still waking up at the same time every day? Yeah, three kids like it. You know, that's the alarm clock. Yeah, you know? yeah. that's like I'm up at seven. You know, no matter what. Yeah, so that's probably it's been probably pretty interesting. Like, damn, I don't have to go into the the field today and train, so I get to go do something else. Yeah, it's a di- you know you're burning your energy in a different kind of way, and I and I gotta remind myself like that's why you know coming here working out with you and um you know doing doing just some other like physical stuff like yoga like by the end of the day usually I'm I was exhausted you know by 
you know, we, we, during spring training, you know, you're showing up at probably seven o'clock, seven thirty, and then you're leaving there by two o'clock, you know, so that that's a good window of time where you're not only outside, but also like working out and stuff. And so you're pretty exhausted by the end of that. And, um, I've had like a ton of energy, you know, so I'm just like trying to figure out ways to burn it and, uh, and do some productive shit too, you know, learn a new skill, try to do new things that like, I didn't have the opportunity to do before. Yeah. And the jujitsu is like, just, it's almost just perfect. You get that push. It's a whole new world as you're starting to realize. And, yeah. uh, Evan's been coming and I think we're at our, on our fourth or coming up on our fifth practice here. Good athlete open-minded and you learn like really well some people you teach jujitsu it's like dude are you fucking even listening to me just listen to me for a second here and evan's got it got it down but have you been finding yourself going on the youtube and and searching up jujitsu videos and shit yeah probably probably to my own fault i mean i I sent you a couple messages you know just being (laughs) like what the fuck is happening here or you know like what do i you know just like basic shit like it it i've i've been as you know like an uh, ufc mma fan for you know, probably, probably I would consider myself, you know, semi die hard for like the last five or six years, you know, oh, really pretty, sweet. Pretty, pretty deep into it, you know, probably like since Sugar, you know, has really started to, I mean, that's probably three years ago where Sugar really started his ascent. Yeah. Um, who, but, who was some of the first fights that kind of got you like, damn, too sweet. Um, early John Jones, for sure. You know, watching John Jones, um, Connor, um, you know, Connor Aldo, I think was one that really like, kind of pulled a lot of guys in um Connor Eddie Alvarez um another crazy fight Hell yeah. um but yeah just like Dustin Poirier love watching Dustin love watching D- Justin Gaith G Max Holloway just like you know dudes that like like war you know like just want to go in and, and go toe-to-toe for the most part but as I'm starting to realize now like doing jujitsu with you and like watching in here, like the technical aspect of the UFC or fighting at the highest level is so intriguing to me, you know, and there's a reason why, you know, guys like Islam and, and uh, Habib, like were so dominant, you know, because it's like, they're, I wouldn't call them one dimensional, but they're the best to ever, like, you know, if those dudes get their hands on you, like you're, you're not, you're not getting away. And I'm yeah. starting to realize that with you, it's like, uh-huh. you know, going against you, like black belt versus a guy who's never done it. Like even, even at the highest of levels, like you realize like this dude isn't anywhere fucking near what Habib is, you know, mm-hmm. even though he's training maybe every day or every other mm-hmm. day, you know? Oh yeah. For so sure. That, that's given me this, this huge appreciation, just a different level of appreciation for the game. Yeah. Hell Yeah. And in like there's because we yesterday, I think we did four or five minute rounds and there's points where you're wanting to give up. You can see it, but you don't give up. You stay tough and stick in there. That's one thing people it's always surprising to them how actually exhausted you. Oh, get. my God. Yeah, it's it's incredible how like, you know, yesterday I, we, we've gone. I think yesterday was our third day and I feel this progression. Now, I haven't gotten much better, but like. I feel like yesterday I felt like in the first round I was able to survive the first round, you know, Mm -hmm. like I've been getting tapped almost every round, maybe once or twice, you know, and, and at least to me, it felt like there was, you know, I'm, I'm I know you're not going a hundred percent, but I felt like, you know, there were moments where you were trying to get to a position where you, you know, you could, you could tap me. And I was able to kind of fight that off the first round. I had like enough gas tank. And then yeah. we go into rounds two and rounds three and rounds four. It's like, I can go for like a minute and a half, you know, but by the end of the round, it's like, I just, you know, I don't want to quit, but I'm gassed. You yeah. Know? So that's like, yeah, you just, you just realize how much it takes, you know, and, and like why dudes who like can strike a little bit, but they're going against a striker. Like they want to take them down and wrestle them, you know, because they want to tire them out. They want to, you know, get like, take some of the pop out of their punches. Like that all makes sense to me now. Yeah. Especially if you got a wrestler who's that's their plan is taking you down and you either get taken down and stand right up or you stuff their shots. The first three shots, it definitely fucks that wrestler's head for sure. And it's going to be interesting versus uh, sugar and Marab. Like we'll see, we'll see how easy it is for Marab to get a hold of Sean but I feel like we're going to find out in the first round pretty quick how that fight's going to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, obviously people people in the lead up to the Aljo fight were, 
you know, that was nonstop the talk. Like, Al just going to get him down. He's going to take his back. He's going to backpack him. He's going to choke him out. You yep. know, like, and I don't know. I mean, I don't, is Marab that much better than Aljo? Like, is he that much slicker or his takedowns that much faster or better? You know, like, he's tenacious for sure. Like, he's going to probably shoot, you know, 10, 15, 20 times in the fight. Um, but, yeah, like you said, I mean... You know, does does Suge just land one on his fucking beak. chin with a knee, or you know, same thing? Like turn catch him beak, backing up, turn that big beak sideways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like Suge is just you know at every at every you know stop of the way, like silenced people. You know, talking about oh, he's, he, he can't fight a wrestler because he's, he's just gonna get his back taken. I love it that people just think he's jujitsu. Like that's one thing that I'm so happy about that we've got to save. He's got a lot of tricks in jujitsu, and. uh no one knows about him. We haven't had to use him in the UFC yet. Yeah. So hopefully this is the fight we get to use him. But we have been training with one of the best to ever do it for coming up on a decade. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that. And it's going to be a, a big, big challenge. It's going to open a lot of people's eyes. I think that last fight with Cheeto opened a lot of people's eyes. Like, damn, he doesn't need to just get lucky. He can beat the fuck out of you for five rounds if he needs to. Yeah. Now, is that is that uh, something... Like, are you guys, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you a question now, but are you guys confirmed? What, is that the fight to make right now? Like, or is that the path that's going down? That's with, what's going to happen Marab? next. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's going to happen next. Not exactly sure what month, but it's probably going to be, uh, come up here in the, in the fall. Is Marab healthy? I think he is. Yeah. I think he is. Yep. I think he's healthy, ready to go. Uh, so looking forward to that in here. So you, are you, are you a big coffee guy? Or not really a coffee guy. You've been liking your caffeine. Yeah, yeah, I love. I mean, I've been drinking your coffee every morning here, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I. Uh, you been getting I'm, a latte? Yeah, I'm just a just a usually cappuccino or latte. I like it a little bit stronger. You know, I I like to taste the coffee. So, I I have an espresso machine at home that I use. That's pretty much my my go to. Um, and I've been trying to you know cut back a little, save a little money, so just buying you know buying the espresso pods, making it at home. So, you're, to, so does your wife do a lot of the cooking or do you do some of the cooking sometimes? No, I cook all the time. For the Cooking's a good time, isn't it? Yeah. I, that's, that's probably, excuse me, that's probably my favorite, um, you know, outside of like physical activity, that's probably my favorite thing to do. So I, I like to spend my time, um, you know, at the, at the store looking for, for stuff to cook and then just trying, trying new things. Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, and you like to throw a uh, steak on the grill or how do you like to cook it? Um... All of the above for places to shop, uh, depending on what you're looking for. You know, I feel like Trader Joe's has more like little like niche things, you know, just like cool like ingredients and stuff that you can find there. All right. Let's check out some uh, some other things that are going on in the world here. Andrew Huberman has been outed for having relationships with five different women at the same time. He's a 48 year old man with the energy to date five different women. If that's not a ringing endorsement of his methods, I don't know what is. People are freaking out about old Andrew Huberman. It's like, it doesn't take away from the fact that he's giving you a good message. He overall is giving a good message. Who cares if he's big pimping on the side? <laughs> it has nothing to do with his teachings, I don't think. Uh, five women at the same time, that's got to take a lot of energy, though, especially when you got a podcast as big as his. Um, five side pieces, so that's kind of interesting there. Uh, one of my buddies is kind of going through some issues in his marriage, just like everyone is. But, and they're going to a relationship therapist. And I feel like going to a relationship therapist could be a dangerous thing. I feel like it could be a good thing if you find a good one. But these relationship therapists, especially if they're bringing up a bunch of stuff that happened 10 years ago. And maybe they're siding with the woman more or siding with the guy more. Uh, I bet you that's hard. When you're going through something and trying to find a relationship therapist, I, I feel like you'd be better off listening to like the real experts like Esther Perel, maybe some podcasts by her or uh, some different things like that. You've been married how long, Evan? Oh shit. Um, eight years. Just, just past uh, eight years. We got married on New Year's Eve. And so, then how long did you guys date before that? Oh, uh, we dated for a while. We, we've been uh, coming just, uh, just past 13 years, I think. Damn. 2011. Hell I went yeah. my way. So, um, yeah, we, we kind of, we kind of just, um, decided to do it that way. Like, um, 
my wife's a little bit older than me. So uh, once we, you know, kind of committed to each other, we both knew that um, we wanted to have kids. So she, we didn't really want to, we knew we wanted to have like a prolonged engagement too. Um, so we decided to have kids first. Um, we had our first two. And when my son, my, our second is, is my son, he was like a year when we got married. So, you know, we took that, um, whatever that was, four years in between. Um, we got married in 15, so... 15 going into 16, like New Year's Eve. So, yeah, so we, we just, we wanted, we, we knew what we wanted, you know, we knew we wanted to have kids first and we knew like we just wanted to take the time to plan kind of the wedding that we wanted. So that was just the road we took. Nice. Yeah. Nice. You guys watch many like shows at home together or what kind of stuff? Do you do? <laughs> no, we don't have any time for that, man. So like, you're usually in bed by what time? Um, You know, it depends. I The, the nighttime for me is, um, usually like I'm more of a night person my wife is a day person so like she enjoys getting up earlier she enjoys getting all her shit done by like one in the afternoon um me it's like my day is getting started at like four you know so I mean although I, I four. p.m yeah like I'm just saying like that's that's where my energy starts to climb usually you know like I'll have this midday lull where it's like from like 2 30 to 4 30 I'm like want to take a nap you know and that's usually maybe from your training at the yeah I mean whatever it is I, I you know I just I just think that that's like my biological clock like that's kind of how it flows you know so like the mornings I can you know I struggle through them and and um, you know I get I, I get done what I need to get done but um yeah so she's in bed by like as soon as the kids go down she's get wants to get in bed which is around eight thirty nine ish yeah which is probably nine o'clock you know and she probably just lays there for like an hour or so and and then you head to the call of duty station yeah and then i go back to the office for a little call of duty or you know grand theft auto or and you've been, do you play with a group of guys on on call of duty yeah it's mainly um just some dudes that like well two guys that i've met um through call of duty that are friends with one of my um i actually used to play with like steven duggar and brandon crawford kurt casali who were guys i played with in, in the big leagues um and then brandon's brother-in-law uh, his name is johnny his he's um he's kind of the guy that i play with now with two of his buddies uh, who are really good so they just they just carry me so you're dropping into the war zone around 9 p.m at night with the yeah. fellas yeah that's 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 usually drop time um and, and then how you how are you slowing down your mind once you get off that and you go lay down it's really not that, for me i don't know why it's not that hard you just zonk um, yeah i just like um you know maybe take me like 15 20 minutes but by that time i'm you know usually like at 11 30 or 12 you know i'm like my eyes are starting to get heavy on the game already anyway so you know i'm just right to bed <laughs> that's funny yeah got nothing better than dropping in the war zone with the boys no oh, man dropping into the war zone with the boys talking about relationship problems talking about whatever you need to talk about and just in war and battle so how long have you been playing that <sighs> probably since the original like what was it verdansk i think the what was the original it was probably i think it was verdansk Purse, just um, so post probably COVID, three, probably three years, four year, yeah, four year, three, four years. Um, and we were just talking about it yesterday. Like Rebirth Island is getting ready to to drop again next uh, week. Yeah, April April third. So that's gonna be a good time. Yeah, gonna be a good time. Yeah, I think is. that's like the for me. It's like video games are are you know they'll always be nostalgic. You know they'll always be like a reminder of your childhood. So I think as you know, even the older that we get, it's still like brings out that youth in you which yeah. I, I really love about it. i'm not very good but um it's still it's still a hell of a time yeah i mean you don't have to go you're not like you're going out to a bar to hang out with the boys and stuff you're just on your game hanging out with the boys i mean i love it people yeah. people think abusing it obviously i mean max i'll play i'll do a lot for a long stream for me is three hours but most of the time it's about an hour and a half i'll get some games in yeah. midday once i get my morning stuff done and i like it a lot yeah i mean as long as you have a routine built around it right and it's not like your whole day is consumed by yeah. just sitting in front of a, a computer or a you just, know a console just being toxic with the boys <laughs> uh i've watched this show i watched a show on 2020 about this ruby frank lady she was an american youtuber she had like two million followers 
and uh, she had a YouTube channel called Eight Passengers, and she was arrest arrested in Washington County and charged with six counts of aggravated child abuse under YouTube oh, Utah law. Four counts to which she pled guilty. She was sentenced to serve between four and 30 years in prison, which is complete bullshit. It's like, put that bitch away for good. She messed up her kids so bad. You guys got to check, check this show out. Um, thankfully, one of the kids escaped, and she, she would, they'd have like tape and saran wrap around his ankles. <laughs> he ended up and put him in a room and not feed him, shave him bald. And it was this, this religious thing. Her therapist that she was going to for her marriage therapy, she ended up moving in with her therapist, getting divorced from her husband. And this therapist like locked these children up in these rooms in the black. And one got away, went to all the neighbors, tried to find some help, found some help. And then the, the cops busted this lady's whole ordeal. But some messed up shit. Really is some messed up shit. What else is in the news here? We got... Uh, this thing is interesting that Alex Jones tweeted. It's this huge cruise ship. It's this huge cruise cruise ship that all the power went out. Oh, yeah, I saw that. It, it knocked down a bridge in Baltimore, huh? And these cars are going over this bridge. All the power's out in this cruise ship, so they can't obviously steer it. And it fucking nails this bridge. Yes. This huge bridge. Six, six people passed away, I think. From, Sadly. from that were driving on the, on yeah, the thing? Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. Jesus, dude. That's yeah, crazy. This is on Twitter. We could probably throw the clip up, uh, Garrett, on the on the tube. Yeah, it smashes that thing. Completely. That's scary. You ever think about that? If there was a <laughs> cyber attack and all the power and everything got shut off? And, yeah, there's, and we, there's just so much that we rely on, right? Like, that you don't even think about. Well, I'm like, okay, you got some money in the bank. You think you're okay. But what if you just wake up and that <laughs> your app's not downloading anymore <laughs> and your card's not yeah. swiping anymore? It's like, what do you got? What's in the fucking house? But it's not even that, right? It's like... Your car's probably not starting. Tesla you know, because like, starting now, well, though. I mean, even every um, every car is computer based now. You know, if you if you freaking EMP, like, there's a big EMP that just fries every computer system. I mean, think about that, dude. Nothing in here is running. Do you have your guns ready to rumble? Yeah. Oh yeah, me too. Well, yeah. I, I just got a thousand uh, rounds for my AR <laughs> thing. I just gotta remember how to load it. Yeah, I mean, they're they're, they're not. They're in safes and they're not coming out unless you know some shit down. happens. You yeah. Know? Like I, I, um, but re, you know, my my wife. I mean, she's she had she's had a couple of um like road rage incidents where she's been driving, you know, and like inadvertently cut somebody off or whatever, you know, and people people just have you know one guy were, were real crazy and and it scared the shit out of me honestly, you know, because she she doesn't have a, a firearm in her car, she doesn't have any protection you know and uh she was with the kids no no she was by herself thankfully um but you know got the guy followed her and was like chasing her and stuff and like after that i was like man like i bought her some pepper spray you know to at least have something in the car because she doesn't want to carry a firearm in the car which you know it's fine you know we have the kids in the car a lot i totally understand but i'm like you gotta have something on you yeah you know and she um you know she plays poker she she's you know probably Pretty close to professional I'd, I'd call her you know she might not call her that but like you know a lot of these poker events are going late into the night and then she's walking to the you know to the car w in, into the you know casino the casino parking lot and like i just you know my mind like races on these oh, things it's yeah. like man like i'm i'm worried about her like i you know it's late at night what happens if she took somebody's money you know or this person's pissed off at her because of a play that she made in a poker game it's like i want her i want her to be protected i want her to feel like you know if something goes down she she has um you know the ability to protect herself so yeah it's just crazy man do you have a uh, uh dogs? You have dogs yeah we have two dogs they're not they're gonna they're little dogs, but they can do shit. They'll, they'll wake, they'll wake us up. Yeah. Which you know? is nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was looking at this, some, some protection dogs and there's this one place in Phoenix that just, uh, supplied people like stars with dogs and they come fully trained. Um, I was thinking about getting one of those, but recently I just got a pretty nice security system at my house, kind of keeping things tight. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes I think about that. I'm like, if all the power and internet shuts off right now, <laughs> what the fuck am I gonna do, dude? Light a candle. God. Hopefully you got a candle in the yeah, house. Yeah, hopefully I got a fucking candle. <laughs> so what else is going on here in the news? So you keep up on Twitter ever or 
What's your, what's your app you mostly use? I use uh, Instagram mainly, um, but I use uh, really, uh, tw- oh, I only use Twitter now when I'm watching the UFC because I can't, you know, like, I feel like they're, you know, mainly looking at their X feed, you know, so it's yeah. like I'll just post on the on X when I'm watching, you know, live events. Um, but I, I rarely ever scroll, you know, X anymore, Twitter. I, I just use Instagram for the most part. Yeah, I try to follow, like, some smarter people on uh, X and that's usually the one if I'm scrolling, I'm usually scrolling on that. Sometimes Instagram, you go to that search feed and they got those tits and butt cheeks and that just sucks <laughs> you in too fucking quick. You just can't get off that <laughs> There's not much good information there. It's mainly just pictures. God, I know. Um, some shit happened with this whole Nickelodeon scandal here. Quiet on set, ex Nickelodeon child star allege abuse and toxic culture. Um, there was a bunch of stuff going on with that. What it revealed blew away any notion that making children's television was an entirely wholesome process. Instead, it shone a harsh spotlight on pervasive toxic culture in the studio, the sexual and psychological abuse suffered by child stars in the 1990s and early 2000s, and the misogyny and the racism of adults. 1990s and 2000s, and then it's just coming about now. Right. That's fucking crazy. At... At its heart was the once lauded producer Dan Schneider, a man hailed as the Norman Lear of children's television for his creations of hit programs such as Drake, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, before his 2018 fall when the first allegations came to light. Six years after he was fired in the wake of the docuseries release, Schneider issued a groveling YouTube apology on Tuesday, apologized to those he offended during a quarter century as Nickelodeon's undisputed and untouchable commander of kids' television. He promised to be better. I mean, you get those guys that are just rich and they feel invisible, and then they're around all these kids. I'm like, fuck. It's like Diddy right now. Well, well, I mean, yeah, the Diddy thing. I didn't even see that. It's like, what do we got going there? The the, I mean, if they get convicted a hundred percent, and it's clear that they're guilty of doing some pedophilia shit, I feel like they need to be killed. <laughs> because <laughs> because the kids that they're doing that to are going to turn into monsters themselves and then it just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. It's um it's But then very if they're falsely accused. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you got like with the Diddy thing, right? It's like you you got to think this you like you, you don't like home like whoever it was, the feds, they're not really busting down doors if they don't have something, right? Like you better be damn sure that you have something pretty pretty concrete before you 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 know you're raiding multiple homes and blowing down doors and stuff. So. Or then you're gonna get a lawsuit. Well, yeah, like the, but then he's what, and then he left. Like he's just gone now. So the raids came a month after a lawsuit filed by music producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones accused Diddy of being the leader of a criminal enterprise that could qualify as a widespread and dangerous criminal sex trafficking or- organization. Damn. So he dipped. Yeah, he he's gone. He went to some some place in in the Caribbean or in South America. Something but some somewhere with no extradition laws is what I read. Jesus, why did did he run away? It is now believed that he actually fled the United States of America in a bid to get away from authorities. His home in both Miami and Los Angeles were raided weeks after the accused of sexual misconduct and alleged trafficking. So he's on the run. Yeah, that's crazy, man. He's on the run. Yeah, it's and it's it's hard when you like. You know, thinking about that when you have kids, right? Like, it's, you know, if you don't have kids, it's like you know, you, you you I you know, I wouldn't say I agree with you one hundred percent. I don't I don't know that anybody should be really just flat out killed, you know. But, really, um, but it's hard not to think that, you know. I, I I'll I'll you know I'll say that, but like yeah, well, when you have your own kids, it's like man, it's it hits harder, dude. Well, it's like that that would be the issue with that the whole the whole killing thing is because is it hundred percent or is that kid being a little shit and lying that would yeah. be the kind of the issue but it's like fuck dude if you have a multiple time offender and they're doing that shit and they keep getting out it's like god they're just creating more monsters every time they do that fucking people's yeah, lives it's, up it's a it's a it's a slippery slope man it's a tough tough conversation to have yeah sure, i don't know about you know? being killed i was being harsher <laughs> so maybe take it back a little bit all right what else I got this uh, little Snapchat meeting with these people here at 11, and then at noon, 
do a striking class for my advanced guys. And this weekend we got Ezra Elliott competing in ADCC, Taya, London, and this other kid named Caesar from my gym. And they all have good chances of, of, of doing really well, especially Ezra. He has a good chance. He beat the kid that won the East Coast Trials that's already going to the big show. And uh, he's an underdog coming into this, and he's going to have some some big matches against some very, very good black belts, and I'm excited for it. Is he a black belt? No. Nope, he's a purple belt, but he's a really, really good wrestler. And and this rule set, it favors wrestlers. Okay. So you can get you can get a negative point when you're when the points are on, the first half of the match is no points. The second half of the match is points. And if you pull guard during the points, then you'll get docked negative one. And it's hard to come back from that when you got really good guys. Um, other than that, yeah, everything's been going good. The coffee shop's been going good. We added the matcha matcha latte. And I still want to get some raw milk going on, but the raw milk's really expensive, so i got to figure out something. And uh, we got a new barista in the morning. Schmitty's working in the afternoons now, and everything's going pretty smooth. I'm working on getting the Red Hawk Job House beans and selling those. Where we get them is this place called Press. It's the Press Coffee Warehouse, and they really, really care about their beans and where they're getting them from, making sure they're organic and good, and um, they're re- really, really good beans. So, what else you got going on this week? Phil? I, I just learned that you uh, that you had a a little coffee channel going before or something. That he, he your uh, producer was just telling me that before you had like a Patreon and you were growing your your following through making coffee, doing yeah. barista work. Yeah, the original bulletproof coffee. That was the one that you got me hooked on. That was where you got me started into coffee. Oh, the old AeroPress. Yeah, the AeroPress method with the uh, the butter and the MCT oil. Yeah. That was the first little recipe I ever did for coffee and that you got me into it. And did you start out on the AeroPress too, Garrett? Yeah. Yeah, you, get, you and Tim or you and Sean both got me uh, doing that, just watching your guys' recipes, the inverted method. And then <laughs> yeah. even you, because you talked about, I think what hooked me was the uh, the world championships of coffee. The, the whole sell that you did on that was like, it made it sound so good. <laughs> Once you, I tried it, I was addicted. You got to YouTube some of those world championships sometimes. But if you if you don't have a ton of money right now, uh, check out the AeroPress. The AeroPress is a good way to get into making us your own little drip coffee, and it makes really good espresso. I used the AeroPress for years, and I loved it. And then once you do add some a little bit of grass fed butter, a little bit of coconut oil, maybe a little honey, a little bit of cinnamon, you suck that thing down. You get fired up. <laughs> yeah. You get fired up, and it's really good. Yeah. Compared to, you go to Starbucks, they're trying to give you the cheapest shit possible. The cheapest sweetener they can find, the cheapest beans they can find, the cheapest milk they can find. And you really feel it after you drink something like that. It spikes your blood sugar. You feel like you can get a little bit of anxiety from it. And you just don't feel good after that, like the shitty cheap cups of coffee. Uh, you've been doing fasting, you said? Just like a little intermittent fasting, yeah. I, I um, I've been trying to do like one day a week where I just don't eat for 24 hours and then um usually between like 14 15 hours is when i have my first meal so i don't know i've been feeling good you know i've had i've had a ton of energy i've been able to like come in here and train with you in the mornings and not be thinking about food um Mm -hmm. although i have like a pretty significant headache by the time we finish training so i don't know if that's like food related or just have you stayed are you staying pretty hydrated yeah, I mean, what I think, maybe I need to drink more water or maybe I need to drink like one of those, uh, you know, Mac lemonades or something before we start. Um, yes. But yeah, I'm, I'm just playing with it. Um, and then also just trying to stay you know, conscious of like the first meal that I'm putting in my body and making sure it's like something decent, you know, it's just protein and not a bunch of sugar, or like processed foods or, you know, shit like that. Um, well, I feel like we could keep talking for, for hours, so I'll definitely have to have you on again, Evan, especially when we have some big fights coming up that we can discuss, and then we can talk about more, uh, watches, because you're into watches, yeah. too. Yeah, got um, a lot to talk about, so yeah. whenever. But I gotta get to this meeting. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. Anytime. And thank you guys for watching. Hit that like and subscribe button, and comment what you guys think below, and, uh, love you guys. See you next week. Bye-bye.